Okay. Um, during the interview, I'll be talking. Uh, this is this episode's coming out November seventeenth. So the drag industry one is coming out November seventeenth. So when I say November seventeenth in the interview, it's because that's the day it's coming out. And don't look at me go. It's not November seventeenth. So. <laughs> no worries. I understand. <laughs> Welcome back to another great Wednesday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today is November 17th, Wednesday, and we are our third episode in on Drag Week here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. And today we have another great guest on the show, and that is Drag Artist Supreme, JV LeMay's Dynasty. JV, thank you so much for doing this. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, so during the interview, uh, I'm going to call you by your drag name, if that's okay. But JV, uh, is it JV LeMay's Dynasty? Like, do I have to say it every single time or do you shorten it from time to time? Like, it, like uh, I, this is the interview. This is, this is what you get when you come on the show is Chris totally. Rambling for the first five minutes. But during the interview, do you mind if I just call you JV or do you want the whole Absolutely. name? No, you can call me JV for feeling nasty. <laughs> awesome. So JV... What does drag mean to you? Um, drag for me is a form of expression. A lot of the times for me, it's very creative and it's very much of an outlet. So um, I like to describe it to people how they have hobbies like guitar or maybe songwriting. Um, some people like to paint. I like to go on stage and shake my ass in front of a crowd, you know? <laughs> That's kind of my hobby. I like to exaggerate gender and make people question what they thought they knew about people and and about experiences and certain sexualities and things like that i love pushing boundaries and making people think about their lives and how it relates to my art so when did you get your start i started very recently actually i started at the end of july <laughs> so like relatively recently like five months ago yeah so what, what was it that said you finally said to yourself, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get on stage and shake what my mother gave me. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, I actually went to a show um, at this local, local Calgary club. It's called Twisted. It's the only gay bar in Calgary, by the way. Um, so I went there and there, they had one of their shows going on. And so I saw all these drag performers in clothing that I thought to myself, like, you know, like I could make something like that. I was looking at it and I was looking at what they had done with the patterns and all of their performances. And I just saw all of the community and the light. And it seems so much more attainable to me at that level than something like RuPaul's Drag Race, where you see all of these Glamazonian, absolutely gorgeous drop dead women who are extremely polished and like masters at their craft. But you think to yourself, there's no way that I could do that. But then, you know, you see somebody who's maybe a little bit new to the drag scene, who's just starting out, who's like finding that persona. And just like me, like I'm finding my persona. And then I feel like that kind of inspired me to be able, like think to myself, oh, okay, this is definitely something that could be at my level if I bring it to myself. What was it like the first time? Because one, oh, the first time you got on stage, I, that, that's a weird question to ask, but when the first time going out publicly and doing drag is probably a nerve wracking experience because you do not yeah. know if it's gonna go good. You're not sure if it's gonna go bad, but also all this hype in your head of, oh, I could possibly do that is now being put on display for people to semi, and let's be honest, since the rise of RuPaul's Drag Race, judge you so yeah 100%. in your opinion or in your words what was it like to go on stage for the first time in the jv lemay's dynasty persona oh my god i was like i was pooping my pants i could not like keep it together i was i was backstage i was probably shaking just like i was shaking so hard i remember i was like I was on the verge of tears, even though I was so excited just because of the nerves and because I'm also like, I'm an extremely anxious human being. I know lots of people out there are, so I, and I'm introverted, right? Like I, I'm not the kind of person that puts myself out there all the time. So I was very, really, I was extremely nervous. And then I remember I went out on stage and I was wearing um, my first ever drag outfit were these tiny little denim, denim shorts. And I was wearing a teeny like white tank top and I wasn't wearing a wig because I didn't have one yet and I my face wasn't really painted the way that I wanted but I didn't know how to do makeup yet so I was just you know I was going with what I had 
um, and I did Call Me By Your Name um, by Little Nas X. And I remember as soon as the song started, I forgot everything that I had planned. And I just kind of, it was ev how every entertainer described it. Like I just completely blanked out. I couldn't really think about the lyrics and I just went for it. And then I remember the judges telling me how well I did. <laughs> and that's kind of about it. Like I, there was a time in that performance where I, was so invested in what I was doing that there was no cognitive thought there really. It was just like, it was just going for it. And it was, it was a song that I had like danced to in my bedroom. So that's kind of how it felt like it was, I was imagining that all of those lights on stage were lights that I had put there myself and I was just in my room. And that made it a lot easier because it didn't really feel like, you know, I'm going out there and, oh my God, it's my first time in drag. Instead it was more like, okay, I'm doing something that's an outlet and it's just my first time. So I, I really didn't have a lot of expectations, um, but the judge that night said a lot of amazing things um, to me. I can't even remember who it was, but I will have to go look and check. But I remember that night being really inspirational and just like, just my heart was filled with so much love for the community because even as a new performer, older queens were coming up to me and telling me like, don't stop doing this. You know, like you were incredible. You have such a great state, state presence. Like here's my number, here's my Instagram, please like reach out to me and just giving me advice. Like it was, it was such a welcoming community that I just fell in love with it right away from that first night. <laughs> so uh, that this is shocking because you're an introvert and the yeah. first time you get on stage to do drag, something that you've <laughs> possibly wanted to do for a while is during a competition where you're judged. You don't, you don't start where, with an open mic drag night, you go right Go big or go home. Let's just go yeah. big or go home. Um, I mean, well, to be honest with you, I found like that's like, so it's called Twisted's Got Talent. It's a little um, competition that Twisted Element puts on every Wednesday night. Um, and it's an open stage. So anybody can sign up. If you haven't done drag at all, you can put your name out there. Um, veteran queens have been doing this for years. will often sign up too. So it's a really good way to get your, get your name out there and also learn from other people. So I know like that definitely, it was intimidating to me too. Cause I, even for the first couple of times I did it, I was like, I don't want to be part of the competition aspect at all. Like I'm just here to have fun. You know, like I, it didn't really matter to me one way or another if I placed or not I was just there to support and see what was going on um but yeah I mean it's it is definitely intimidating to start out with having a bunch of people kind of judging you and giving you constructive criticism but by the same token I learned so much by doing it that way because people were telling me what to do better and what I could improve on now, um, before the interview via Instagram, when we originally had connected, um, I, I, let's back up here for a second. I'm going to ask this question first. The drag yeah. industry is a, in the past, has traditionally been a male industry. It is a male yeah. industry um, uh, with women performers. Men dress up as women to perform. Uh, their drag persona is a woman. Mm -hmm. When we had originally, I reached out and you reached out to me, we had talked and we're also doing another episode with you later on this season, Transgendered yeah. Week. You are a transgendered Albertan yep. and you are transgendered know. in the drag industry. I want to talk yeah. about that for a second. Sure. How has the drag, industry, uh, drag community in Alberta, is particularly in Calgary, supported you during your uh, sort of launch into the industry this relatively new into the year? I have honestly been welcomed with nothing but open arms. Um, I think as of the past probably decade to about five years, um, AFAB queens, so um, assigned female at birth queens, um, have become a lot more accepted in the community, especially just like in drag in general, because I have met quite a lot of performers who identify as cis women out of drag and perform as women on stage. And I've also met a lot of trans men who do drag king stuff or like cis men who do drag king. Like there's so many different variations. And there's also lots of performers who identify as non-binary on stage and kind of bring this really unique mix of androgyny, femininity and masculinity to the stage and bringing any kind of vocals that they want. And I love those kinds of performances, being able to mix in all of these different elements. And those to me 
are very groundbreaking. And I think that a lot of people are starting to see that, if that makes sense. Like a lot of drag performers have started to come around to the idea of everybody doing drag. Like it's not necessarily, it's not this boundary of you have to be a gay cis man in order to do drag. It's more like if you're a human being that wants to put yourself out there and do this weird expression of gender, then you can. Like literally I have friends that like one of my buddies, Joe, the, her name's Joe exclamation point. She's a straight man out of drag. She dates women exclusively, uses he, him pronouns, is a cis man, just started doing drag this year. Like is very, was very much in the heteronormative kind of lifestyle, if, if you will. Um, and then started going out to gay bars and just became a part of the drag scene. So I think like it's becoming so much more inclusive than it was. And that's another very common misconception is when I tell people that I'm a drag queen, they're like, well, aren't you a trans man? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm also a drag queen. And they're like, what? Like, it, you know, a lot of people don't really put two and two together. They don't think that it happens, but it's becoming a lot more common and I think accepted than it was in the past couple of years. Oh, so I'm assuming someone there's with you. <laughs> he just looked up and smiled. Oh, sorry. My partner just headed out for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's the great thing about doing these via Zoom. There's always those background. My dog might make an appearance from time to time as well. Oh, don't um, worry about that. Okay. Let's, the industry in Calgary is quite tight knit. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've I've literally in my life I've been to one drag show and that was in August of this year, that was with Visa Decline, uh, Jessica Rabbit and Chaos, first inter the first ever drag show I have ever been to in my life and that was at Twisted here in Calgary. Beautiful. The 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 the, the camaraderie between the 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 performers to the, the drag stars that were there was so tight knit. As someone who is relatively new to the community, to the drag scene, was it hard to break in? Or with the rise of RuPaul's Drag Race, with the rise of Drag Race Canada, have people become more accepting to new people wanting to be in the industry? Um, honestly, I did find it was a little challenging the first couple times, especially as an introvert, like I mentioned, like being so <laughs> reserved and kind of to myself like I, I had my big fat headphones on the first time that I was there I was in the dressing room like this I was like <laughs> oh, please don't be talking you know because I'm like I was so anxious and intimidated by all these beautiful people um but I think the more that you put yourself out there and the more that you keep doing it and the more that you just it kind of express yourself and continue to keep true to what your art is the more people will start to enjoy that and like recognize you because I like I think it was probably the third time I did TGT and went to Twisted like the bartenders started noticing me and like they were like oh hey JV like what's up and I was like oh my god hi <laughs> you know so um just like kind of doing the same patterns and showing up in the same place really helps with that feeling of like breaking into this new circle because that was definitely challenging at first but like I found, especially with people like Jessica and um, Dan Gleibitz, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's another amazing entertainer. Um, but Jessica especially has been so welcoming. She was one of the first people that introduced herself um, when we were backstage. And she, like, yeah, she's just lovely. Like, And she is very representative of a lot of people in the community that are very willing to chat you up and have a smoke with you after and, you know, like get your Instagram, get your number, like, it, it all depends on, on you and your comfort levels and what you're wanting out of it. If, if you're just wanting to go and perform and be on stage, then, you know, to each their own. I think that's, that's one thing. If you're wanting to create connection and build a community out of it, then there is so much opportunity to do it. What have you learned about yourself as a drag performer? I've learned how comfortable I am with myself. <laughs> um, that has been, and I know that sounds a bit like weird, but I, before doing drag, I, there were a lot of things about my body and about my personality or just things about me that I was very insecure about. And I still am, like everybody has certain insecurities, certain things about themselves that we're not so proud to admit, right? But for me, it was like overwhelming. And I found being able to put myself on stage 
and face those insecurities head on and kind of present them to the world where I'm showing off my chubby stomach and I'm showing off my thighs that aren't like perfectly sculpted and my biceps that aren't like bulging out because I haven't been to the gym in a while, you know? And I'm like showing off these parts of myself that other people are still coming up to me and telling me like, your legs are beautiful or I love your body hair or things like that where I'm hearing these compliments that I never thought of as things that I liked about myself and then I'm growing to embrace like that has been one of the biggest and best changes that has come out of the industry for me for sure and that's helped me like recognize just I don't know how much how important it is to really like take care of yourself (laughs) and to like take what other people say into account in the best way that you can like hearing other people's compliments and really taking them in has altered my perception of myself for sure (laughs) um before we talk about well we've talked about some good things i want to talk about some bad things as well because there are some things that happen in the drag community but also in a more conservative province like like alberta but i want to i want to ask the question who is jv lemay's dynasty (laughs) jv i always like to describe JV or myself um, as very glam, elegant, poised, a little bit trashy at points, but I, I like to describe myself as very sweet and very outgoing in my drag persona. I tend to, I love making connections with people and I really like to stick around. Like if I'm ever at a performance, I'll be at the stage. I'll just kind of like putter around and talk to people and be like, oh, hey, did you like the show? Like, you know, what's your name? Where did you come from? Where are you, you know, I just, I really like talking to people as JV because I think that it's just a lot different from that because I'm a lot more extroverted in that drag persona. And I think, (laughs) yeah, I think that's definitely like a way that I would, put it would be I'm, I'm much more out there and able to make connection and I I think that JV is definitely going to rock the drag scene in a couple of years I hope so <laughs> um while I've asked I've asked uh different drag queens the same question I'm gonna ask it to you as well because how did the name come about how did the name JV LeMay's Dynasty come about? Because I've talked to uh, I've talked to one a drag queen back in Ontario where they said that they got their name uh, from their drag mother. So for you, where did the name come from? Yeah, I got my name from my drag mother and my drag father. So um, my drag mother is Lady Willow LeMay's. She is a local Calgary performer, and she's a bit of an older queen. Um, and she's been doing drag for about four years. So I met her at my first time doing TGT and she was one of the only queens that, cause she was also kind of like sitting by herself, kind of keeping to her own, being introverted. Um, And I, you know, we just started making a connection. One of us walked up to the other and we just started talking and um, it's kind of been history since then. She's been able to get a lot of gigs for me, thankfully. And we've done lots of fundraisers together. She's been a part of my shows and vice versa. So that's where the LeMay's part of my name comes from. And then um, my, the dynasty part of my name is from my drag dad, Asymmetrical Dynasty. He, I met him probably my third or fourth time doing drag. And he is part of a community in Calgary called Cyberstash. And Cyberstash is an all ages drag trope who um, they do both virtual and live entertainment. So they'll do like virtual drag shows and they host a couple shows at like different bars across the city. But um, he hosts all of it and he saw me perform and we really hit it off together, had a really good time talking. And I was like, you know, I'm really looking for a mentor in this industry. And then um, he was like, I would love to be your drag parent. So he's my drag daddy. And then Lady Willow was like, I, can I join in on this? Like, please let me be a part of the family. So we all kind of like converged at that show. Um, and then my actual original drag name was JV Varsity. <laughs> like Varsity, you know, cause like it was, it was a pun. <laughs> okay, I was like Varsity and then it was like Varsity. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. There's always a pun <laughs> in these names, aren't there? Exactly. Um, um, but, so that's where like the JV part comes from. And like, that's, you know. That's, and so then it all kind of just converged into this long name of me. <laughs> we, and I say we in the royal we, because I don't think many 
Canadians and people who might be listening to this understand what a drag family is. Yeah. And I want to know from your own mouth, what is a drag family? Like when you talk about a drag father, or a drag mother, what does that mean to you? Well, for me, um, so not, not to get like too sad or kind of like dim the mood down, but um, I actually left home at the age of 15 uh, because of my family and the fact that they weren't quite on board with the whole um, identity thing. So after I left home, I was in and out of homeless shelters, in and out of group homes, kind of couch surfing, just lit, paying my way. I found jobs through kitchens to make a living. That's where I'm at right now. I'm a line cook in my real life. Um, so after a while, I, you know, got a place for myself. I bought my own apartment. I started becoming a little bit more successful in my life, got sober, all that great stuff. And then um, I started getting into drag and I would meet these older queens <laughs> that you know would have babies their drag babies and all these tight-knit families and it made me just yearn for that and so when the opportunity had pre presented itself I had the same question as you like I didn't really know what that meant but what I've come to learn is it's very similar to how a biological family operates like you know, you've got the, you've got the weird sister, you've got the crazy uncle, you've got the annoying younger brother, like you've got all of these similar family elements, but the only difference for me was how accepting and loving everything was. It was, it's all just pure unconditional love, where I feel like I can come to either of my drag parents about anything that's going on in my life. It doesn't matter what it is, if, even if it's gross and something that like I should be telling my doctor, like I would probably still tell them because it's that level of, of closeness and of just openness and being able to have that kind of connection. So it's very much like you probably heard the term chosen family. A lot of people have said that term. That's very much what it is, is where you're picking people that deserve to be a part of your family and deserve to be a part of your life and vice versa. You're like, you know, you're, you're becoming a big part of their life. So it's, it's just wonderful. It's very much, it's very much like a biological family, but to me, it's like the perfectly healthy biological family, if that makes sense. <laughs> it, it, it does. And I appreciate you being honest about that. Of course. I want to now turn to the ugly side. Sure. Because we are in a conservative province. Yeah. Um, now, as I stated earlier on in the episode, um, we are sitting down and we're going to be talking about transgendered, being transgendered in Alberta later on. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk being a drag star in drag queen in Alberta, in Calgary. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, Alberta and Calgary are not a progressive city. Let's be honest, we have elected our first female mayor, but we still have work to do. Absolutely, we do, yeah. In your short time being in the drag industry, have you ever felt unsafe? Yeah, absolutely. How so? Um, especially, I would say it's mostly transportation, like just getting to and from the venue and being out in public and drag, because I find in my house, I'm safe when I am, because I live actually like downtown. I'm in the very core of downtown. So when I leave my apartment building, I am subjected to a lot of men hitting on me and a lot of those same men, once I talk to them, will kind of take a, do a double take because they don't know what's going on. They don't know what I am and that confuses them and that intimidates them. So I have had many instances of having some man or some person come up to me and be like, hey, baby, and just, you know, try to hit on me. And I've gotten in their face and been like, what do you want? What is it? And then they've gotten aggressive with me. And I actually, um, I was on my way to a drag show and I got robbed <laughs> at a train station and I was, I was in drag. Um, I saw a man and a woman, the man was being aggressive with the lady. And I was like, I walked up and I went in my big deep man voice. I went like, Hey guys, like <laughs> what's going on? Like, why are you bugging her? And so then the lady turned on me and she got in my face. She got pretty aggressive and they told me to hand over my phone. I gave it to them. And the whole time they were just, you know, throwing out slurs at me, just being really rude. Um, so I, I did get the police involved. Unfortunately, like there hasn't really been much headway on that. But, you know, that, that, that whole situation is what it is. But that was probably the moment in which I felt the most unsafe and the most like targeted in that instance. Because I was like, you wouldn't be saying these kinds of things 
to somebody if they were cis presenting or if they were if it wasn't a man wearing a dress like you wouldn't be calling me a freak and all these terrible things if i presented a certain way you know um i i'm gonna i, I apologize if i ask inappropriate hard questions and if there's ever a question i ask that you don't want to answer please just tell me to go screw myself and i will move on to the next question absolutely at that moment in time when you get robbed when you get things verbally thrown at you and yeah. i've heard other stories where drag queens have been assaulted yeah do you ever go to the point where you say i can't do it anymore i i i i wish i could but if this is the vile the hate that i'm getting spewed uh, thrown at and I, I, I think in 2021, we shouldn't be living in that type of society, but unfortunately we are. Do you ever think to yourself, maybe I just need to hang up the, 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 the dress and just move on and go to something else? Honestly, I mean, the thought has slipped my mind a, a couple of times, like especially in those moments of crisis and like terror, really, where you're just <laughs> really freaked out. Um, I definitely thought to myself, like, is this the right move for me? Like, is this safe? should I be doing this right now um but I think ultimately what makes it worth it to me is being in those safe spaces and feeling those feelings all again because I'll have this one shitty moment and then I'll have five amazing moments on stage that completely override that one shitty moment so I think it's like yes it does really suck and it can be very dangerous and <laughs> like I know my drag mom even has struggled a lot with being harassed on public transit and has had instances of being assaulted and had similar instances happen but she comes back every time and she still goes to shows and it's because of the passion that's there and because of the love for for performing and just putting yourself out there because for a lot of performers like this is our livelihood this is what we do like it, it would be like, am I going to quit my job as a bouncer because some guy spat in my face? No, I'm going to keep being a bouncer because I love protecting people. It's the same thing. Like just because somebody's being an asshole and having a bad day, whatever it is that they choose to do, that doesn't mean that I'm going to sacrifice my happiness and my livelihood so that they get to feel better about themselves, you know? Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. We, as we, as I said before, and we are in 2021, we are in a society where um, if this, if you were to do this in the 90s, it probably wouldn't have been as acceptable or looked upon in a more uh, national spotlight because the rise of RuPaul's Drag Race has changed the game of drag. It has become more mainstream and more people are talking about it. Are you seeing in your short time in the industry a more willingness to ex uh, not accept, but go and enjoy themselves at a drag show because of the popularity that is RuPaul's Drag Race? Because um, I, I've talked to straight people who, and even my father, and my father is the typical farmer who grew up in a very conservative household. He would say, he told me when I came out, let's go to a drag show. I'm like, well, what? Like, what is this all about? So when you, when you uh, perform and when you talk to uh, people who might not traditionally be the quote unquote liberal progressive and they're yeah. more conservative and they say, uh, sure, do what you want to do and you're happy. Does that give you hope for society in some sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I think that like, it doesn't matter what your orientation is, what your background is you can still enjoy the art of drag. Like e even if you don't ever want to be on stage, if you don't ever want to put makeup on your face, if that's something that scares the shit out of you, completely fair, I understand. But that doesn't have to stop you from witnessing this lovely community. And I think like I've seen a lot of people even just like 
on the side of the road at bars that I've been to hosting shows. And I've been like, you want to come see a drag show? And they'll, <laughs> and they'll either be like, yeah, sure. And they'll like, come on. Side. Or they'll be like, no, thank you. We're getting soup. And they'll like walk the other way, you know, but like I've had people come in and then be introduced to this community and like, then follow me on Instagram. Like I, and then message me a couple weeks later telling me like, I went to a couple shows at Twisted because I saw your drag show and then I got curious and I love this community. Like it's so, you know, so I think that it really, it shouldn't make any kind of difference what your political background is. Like I can understand a, a lot of people on maybe the more conservative end of the spectrum being intimidated or just not wanting to be a part of it. Again, I understand, fair. But I think that if you're, you know, leaning a little more centrist or if you're still kind of feeling unsure about it, just try it. Like there's no harm in it, especially an all ages show. Going to all ages shows can be a really good option for people that don't want to see a lot of vulgar material because drag is known to be a little bit more on the raunchy side. Um, but if you want to see just pure fun and pure entertainment, try an all ages show. Just, you know, experiment once in a while. Try it out because you, you never know if you're going to like it unless you give it a shot. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you watched RuPaul's Drag Race before you started performing uh, drag. I, it, it, this, this, these are the questions that I've always wanted to ask drag queens. So I apologize if I ask these stupidly, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I like asking the stupid questions. Bring it on. You have now been in the industry for about five months. Looking back on those five months and looking back on what you saw on RuPaul's Drag Race UK, whatever, whatever season or whatever episodes they, how many seasons there are or iterations of it there are, have you gone and thought to yourself, this isn't what I signed up for? Like RuPaul is like the RuPaul Drag Race has like given me this un unrealistic expectation of what I was going to go into when I started drag. Um, yeah, actually, very much. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will say, like, a lot of the queens on RuPaul's Drag, and it, it is a reality show. I think that's a concept that a lot of people, like, forget. forget about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, reality. Whatever. But it's, like, it's very much, like, scripted in a way to create drama and create press. So I think a lot of the times, the queens that say the shadiest things, say the meanest shit to each other, get the most attention. And they are the ones that will get the most screen time, get the most like whatever on, on the show. And that's a big part of what people think of drag is like a lot of performers, a lot of people think that it's like the reading challenge all the time where they're just constantly rude. And it's like, girl, I understand. Like you think that we're on the set of RuPaul's Drag Race right now, but we're human beings. Like we're both performers. I'm talking to you like a human being. So we don't have to be doing all this like reading shit where it's like, well, your lashes are clumpy and gross. Well, your lips are blah, blah, blah. And you're just going at each other all the time. Like, I think that is a really big misrepresentation of what the drag scene is because for me, it's a lot of love. And I know like a lot of queens have banter with each other, but it's a lot different, I think, than what it's put on as the show. Cause it's very like com competitive, which the drag scene is. But I think that, Drag Race can sometimes exaggerate a lot of elements of that competitive spirit of being like, well, this is like life or death and, you know, people crying, people having these really, really big moments. And those happen, sure. But it doesn't... But you're meaning that Eve 3000's little crying fit that happened doesn't happen on a regular basis? That's right. I, mean, well, I don't know her personally, but... <laughs> That's right. I watch RuPaul's Drag Race or Candace Drag Race. I get these references now. Look oh, at me. Yes, I'm so proud of you. You've done your research. <laughs> we got have nothing else to do during this pandemic. So gotta, yeah. gotta get up on my gay culture, as my husband tells me all the time. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up here, um, mm -hmm. JV, is talk to the young boy young girl who's thinking who may not be old enough to do it uh do drag but who has always thought that they might want to right. why why would why would they potentially what why should they or why should they try it at least once drag because you will never look at life the same way again and because i think that being able to express yourself, especially with gender, 
and taking something that is so personal to you and bringing that out in front of people, regardless of how that looks, is one of the most valuable and important things that you can do. And I think that it's one of the highest art forms. I truly think that gender is one of the things that's so deep inside of you that people can't even comprehend it sometimes. And bringing that out and being able to visualize it or put it into a way that other people can experience it the same way you do is so powerful. I think it's one of the most powerful skills you can ever learn in your entire life. And it's, it's, it's not a lesson that you'll ever learn in school. It's not something that you can learn in any other job except for doing drag. So I think if, if there's a young person out there that has thought about getting into it or wants to do it in the future, start looking at make, makeup tutorials on YouTube. Get yourself inspired. Like, you know, I know it sounds like kind of silly and menial, but go on Pinterest, like find out some queens that you really admire and look up to and look at how they do their clothing. See if you can match that. See if you can make looks for yourself that make you feel confident and proud and then showcase that for yourself. And then eventually if you, get, if you feel comfortable, maybe you can start making some money off of it. Like you never, sometimes you can turn it into career and sometimes it's just something that you keep inside your bedroom. And but, now let, let's talk about the other side of that. Talk to the yeah. people who think what you do is wrong. Think what you do as an artist, as a performer is wrong and you shouldn't be do, up on stage being a drag queen. Right. Talk to them right now. Why, you know, why should they care at the end of the day? Or why shouldn't they care about what you do or anyone else does at the end of the day? It honestly has zero impact on anybody else. I am here doing my thing, unless you come to Twisted Element every Wednesday night and I'm impeding your night, in which case I don't think that you mind. <laughs> like, I'm really not in your way here. Like, I think that a lot of, especially people that have a problem with what I do, have this idea that I'm interfering with their life or that I'm <clears throat> diminishing their quality of life somehow by merely existing. I could say the very same thing about y'all. Like I'm not going around on some kind of tirade being like, oh, I hate people that are on the right and I hate people that have voted for so-and-so. Like that's, you. <laughs> there's a level of respect where I'm, I'm being respectful towards people that don't agree with my art and I appreciate the same. If you don't agree with what I do, then I respect that. And you don't have to agree with what I do. Frankly, I'm not here for you, I'm here for me. So like you can have your opinion and that, you know, like it's, it really doesn't bother me at the end of the night. I'm not, I, I respect that. And I also think that it would be a good idea to like get out of the house once in a while, you know, like maybe find a hobby, find something to do, with your time instead of worrying about what drag performers are doing every day. You know, like I, that's just my kind of two senses. I don't think that it should have no. much of a connotation on other people. I think that a lot of people lose sleep over it when they really shouldn't. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. Um, for those who have been listening, uh, for those who might want to see what, what it looks like for JV LeMay's dynasty to look like in drag, because you are out of drag right now for those who are watching. How can people potentially go out and check you out? Do you have any social media feeds that we can link in the show notes? Yes, I sure do. So my Instagram is my name. It's just JV LeMay's Dynasty. There's a little period in between uh, JV LeMay's and Dynasty. Um, that is pretty much my main social media. If you want, you can follow me on TikTok. I don't really post on there, but it's Zeke Smith 58 there's some drag content on there, some just silly, stupid, whatever content. So um, if you'd like to give me a follow, you're more than welcome to. But um, a lot of show dates are always posted there. So if you're Calgary local, come on out and get nasty. <laughs> um, for those who have listened to the show and watched the show before, you know what I'm about to say. Um, I do not understand TikTok. I do not get it. So I will not be linking JV's uh, TikTok in the show notes, but I will be linking their uh, uh, Instagram account in the show notes. I would highly recommend you go check it out because some of the content that they have put up is amazing. 
I am a fan. Uh, I would highly recommend anyone go follow them because it is a fantastic art form that you are doing, JV. And I appreciate that you have bursted onto the Calgary scene as much as you have in the last five months. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me today. It was amazing just to have this conversation and be able to put my thoughts out there into the world. So thank you for having this platform and for having all of us performers. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in to the Cross Border Interview Podcast for this Wednesday, November 17th edition of the show. We will be back tomorrow, Thursday, November 18th, for another great episode with another great performer, uh, drag performer, drag queen, however you want to say it. Um, but also remember, hit the subscribe button where if you're watching this on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, social media, all the links are in the show notes. And if you want, if you feel like the independent journalism that we're doing here needs to continue, go over to our Patreon account and donate to $3. It helps us continue the show. Um, thank you so much. And as always, keep talking on this Wednesday afternoon. See you tomorrow morning, guys.